These must exist in a relatively flat ontology in which there is hardly any difference between a person and a pincushion, and relationships, including causal ones between them, must be vicarious and hence aesthetic in nature. The discovery of hyperobjects and object-oriented ontology are symptoms of a fundamental shaking of being, a being quake. The ground of being is shaken. There we were, trolling along in the age of industry, capitalism and technology, and all of a sudden, we received information from aliens. Information that even the most hard-headed could not ignore. One reason why is because the form in which the information was delivered was precisely the instrumental and mathematical formulae of modernity itself. The Titanic of modernity hits the iceberg of hyperobjects. Unlike Latour then, I do believe that we have been modern and that we are only just learning how not to be. For one thing, we are inside them, like Jonah in the whale. This means that every decision we make is in some sense related to hyperobjects. These decisions are not limited to sentences in texts about hyperobjects. When I turn the key in the ignition of my car, I am relating to global warming. When a novelist writes about emigration to Mars, he is relating to global warming. Yet my turning of the key in the ignition is intimately related to philosophical and ideological decisions stemming from the mathematization of knowing and the view of space and time as flat, universal containers. Descartes, Newton. The reason why I'm turning the key, the reason why the key turns, sends a signal to the fuel injection system, which starts the motor, is one result of a series of decisions about objects, motion, space, and time. Ontology, then, is a vital and contested political terrain. It is on this terrain that this study will concentrate a significant amount of action. In the menacing mist of hyperobjects, contemporary decisions to ground ethics and politics in somewhat hastily cobbled together forms of process thinking and relationism might not simply be rash, they might be part of the problem. The towering through of the hyperobject into the misty transcendentalism of modernity interrupts the supposed progress that thinking has been making towards assimilating the entire universe to a late capitalism-friendly version of Macbeth, in which, in the phrase Marx quotes, all that is solid melts into air. I've heard Nick say that at least twice. <laughs> For at the very point at which the melting into air occurs, we've catched the first glimpses of the all-too-solid iceberg within the mist. The ship of modernity is equipped with powerful lasers and nuclear weapons, but these very devices set off chain reactions of causality that generate yet more hyperobjects that thrust themselves between us and the extrapolated predicted future. Science itself becomes the emergency break that, that brings the adventure of modernity to a shuddering halt. But this halt is not in front of the iceberg. The halting is an aspect of the iceberg. The fury of the engines is precisely how they cease to function, seized up by the ice that is already inside them. The future, a time after the end of the world, has arrived too early. Hyperobjects, it turns out, are a good candidate for what, he for what Heidegger calls the god, or what the poet Holderlin calls the saving power that grows alongside the dangerous power. We were perhaps expecting an eschatological solution from the sky, or a revolution in consciousness, or indeed a people's army seizing control of the state. What we got instead came too early for us to anticipate it. Indeed, the already here aspect of hyperobjects is one of their most compelling features. In one fell swoop, hyperobjects have dispensed with 200 years of careful correlationist calibration. A small boy runs in front of an oncoming truck. You watch in horror as you realize the truck can't slow down in time. You think you should save the boy, but you're still unsure. Still, the moment compels you to act you rush into the street and grab the boy, yanking him out of the way just in time. As the truck bears down upon you both, you manage to half stumble, half jump clear. The boy is safe. You have no idea why you did what you just did. You just did it. It seemed like the right thing to do. A certain immediacy was involved, but you feel strange. You had no good reason to save the boy. I walked down the same street two weeks later. Not having learned his lesson, the same small boy runs out in front of an oncoming truck. I think I should save him, but I'm not sure. I hesitate. I do a quick moral calculation. Ethical action is based on utility, and existing as such is a good, so I should save the boy. Or the boy is related to me, is my cousin, he is my doctor's niece's school friend. I decide to save the boy. Too late, the boy is dead. Two weeks later, still at exactly the same spot, people wonder why accidents happen there for years afterwards, another small child, a girl, runs out in front of another truck. A stranger is walking down the street. She thinks she should save the girl, but she is unsure. She does a quick series 
of calculations. Is the truck going so far that it won't be able to slow fast, that it won't be able to slow down in time? Perhaps it can slow down. Does the truck have sufficient momentum that even if it slowed down, it would still plow into the girl? Is the friction of the road surface enough to weaken the truck's inertia and bring it to a halt, even though it would continue to slide towards the girl even if the driver jammed on the brakes? All things being equal? You decide that the truck will inevitably hit the girl and you are correct. The truck did just hit the girl, <laughs> killing her instantly. <laughs> it would be easy to confuse your actions. You are the one who just saved the boy without a well-formed reason. For a kind of irrationalist, just do it attitude, a kind of anti-intellectual, pseudo-zen valuation of immediacy over reflection. Doing versus thinking. But in fact, you are very intelligent. You know that all the reasons in the world are not enough of a reason to fall in love. You just save the boy. But in doing so, you have an extraordinary feeling of uncanniness. The words of talking heads is once in a lifetime spring to mind. This is not my beautiful boy. This is not my beautiful street. This is not my beautiful action. Isn't this precisely the situation we are in when confronted with hyperobjects? When it comes to global warming, finding a good reason for tackling it may be one of the greatest inhibiting factors against actually doing anything about it. There are just not enough reasons. Utilitarianism is deeply flawed when it comes to working with hyperobjects. The simple reason why is that hyperobjects are profoundly futural. No self-interest theory of ethical action whatsoever, no matter how extended or modified, is going to work when it comes to an object that lasts for 100,000 years. And that's the longest time frame for global warming. Right? In 100,000 years from now, 7% of global warming effects will still be here, slowly being absorbed by igneous rocks. There is then a radical asymmetry between the urgency and the passion and the horror that we feel when confronted with a hyperobject that could profoundly alter life on Earth, and the sense of cognitive weirdness and irony that we feel for exactly the same reason. The asymmetry is very refreshing, really. Hyperobjects make hypocrites of us all. The weirdness and irony derive from the fact that to adopt a telling idea of Kierkegaard's inside the hyperobject, we are always in the wrong. Doing nothing evidently won't do at all. Drive a Prius? Why not? I do. But it won't solve the problem in the long run. Sit around criticizing Prius drivers? Won't help at all. Form a people's army and seize control of the state? Will the new society have the time and resources to tackle global warming? Solar panels? They take a lot of energy to make. Nuclear power? Fukushima and Chernobyl, anyone? So, stop burning all the fossil fuels now? Are we ready for such a colossal transition? Every position is wrong. Every position, wrong unquote, every position including and especially the kind of know-it-all cynicism that thinks that it knows better than anything else. Why? Every position takes place inside the hyperobject, and inside the hyperobject, we are always in the wrong. The insideness I am describing here is not simply a physical location. Even if you go to Mars, as I argued earlier, you're going there in response to the biosphere and to the climate. No, this within the hyperobject has to do with the way in which the hyperobject distorts my idea of time. There are time scales of global warming, the horrifying, the terrifying, and the petrifying. 500, 30,000, and 100,000 years, respectively. 500 years, that's the 100% effect. Um, by 500 years, there'll still be 75% of global warming. 30,000 years from now, 25%, and 100,000 years from now, 7%. These very large finitudes collapse my cliched ideas of time from within. It isn't that hyperobjects are a special kind of being, like an angel or a demon or a god, sent to slap my objectification. Isn't it that hyperobjects are a special kind of being, like an angel or a demon or a god, sent to slap my objectification of reality upside the head by hurtling me into contact with the transcendental beyond? Far from it. Hyperobjects are real things, really existing in this physical realm. 500 years is a real time scale in the sense that it has been measured using scientific instruments to a certain degree of precision. 350 parts per million is a real number, real in the sense that it fits the reified view of particles occupying points in an objective space and time. In this case, 350 parts per million is the upper bound of particles of carbon compounds in air that provide for a relatively stable, recognizable Earth for the foreseeable future. Earth is currently at 392 parts per million. These numbers, these reified time scales, eat away at my reification from within. Like Aikido masters, they use my energy against itself. I become convinced of the uncanny futurality of non-humans, not through some religious conversion, but through reification itself. It's, it sticks much better that way. I haven't been converted to belief 
in a non-objectified beyond, but rather my prejudices have collapsed from within through their very objectification. Is it possible to lapse into high degrees that the cure for nihilism comes from within nihilism itself? From within the reified hyperobjects we have in part created through that very technology whose measurements are products of the very latest, fastest, most complex performances of that same technology. Complexity theory, mapping climate using supercomputers, particle accelerators. The ontological, not to say psychic and social, economy of such an arrangement is startling. I need no special props, no deus ex machina. I don't need the apocalypse. Indeed, as we saw in the previous section, such thoughts inhibit intimacy with the strange strangeness of these non-humans. The trivially mathematized fact of hyperobjects' longevity is all the help I need. It is simply a matter of getting used to this mathematical fact. Getting used to is a fair translation of the Greek mathesis. So what is it like inside the hyperobject in which we are always in the wrong? Let's consider Alfonso Lingus's reworking of Kantian ethics. Lingus does this by situating the transcendental a priori in what he calls the level generated by an object. It's physical grip on me, a grip that sends directives to me. Here is Lingus's own example, which is compelling in an ecological way. You're walking through a sequoia forest in Northern California. The gigantic trees surround you with their ancient forms. Vast networks of lichen spread themselves around the branches. You smell smoke and look in the direction of the smell to see the glowing tip of a cigarette butt like a bright orange bead in the ferny undergrowth. You leap over towards the ferns, parting them with your foot, and stamp on the cigarette before pouring water from your water bottle over the area to ensure that no fire can start again. It's significant that Lingus chose the burning cigarette. Not only is it the case that the ecological emergency confronts us with countless moments such as this, you leave your house and realize you left the lights on, you stop at the car wash and wonder whether you should turn the engine off and swelter in the drought outside without air conditioning, it is more deeply the case that ecological issues present us with very pure versions of what Lingus calls levels and directives. Non-humans, argues Lingus, tell us how to dispose ourselves towards them. A hammer wants to be held in a certain way. A forest path issues directives to my body to walk at a certain pace, listen for animals, avoid obstacles. A cigarette butt demands that I put it out. These directives grip me already before I can reflect, rationally or not, on the right course of action. The Kantian notion of synthetic judgment presupposes these levels, argues Lingus. The directives issue from entities that establish levels, zones, of aesthetic causality in which I find myself caught. These directives are what ground the categorical imperative itself, not some decision in a void. Why do I step up to stamp out the burning cigarette? From this point of view, free will is overrated. We are seduced and induced by the leaves, tennis rackets, gas pedals, and passers-by. I do not find myself in a single solid world, but rather in a shifting set of zones emitted by specific objects. The hyperobject then also emits zones that gather us in like the tractor beam that locks onto the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars 4. I shall use the term zone rather than level from now on, since to my ear zone eliminates a certain sense of flatness and structure. In this notion of the emergence of time and space from an object, we can begin to understand the term zone. Zone can mean belt, something that winds around something else. We talk of temperate zones and war zones. A zone is a place where a certain action is taking place. The zone winds around, it radiates heat, bullets fly, armies are defeated. What action is taking place? Not something that just is what it is, here and now, without mystery, but something like a quest, a tone on its way, calling forth echoes and responses, water seeking its liquidity in the sunlight rippling across the cypresses at the back of the garden. It, if as suggested earlier, there is no functional difference between substance and accidents, if there is no difference between perceiving and doing, if there is no real difference between sentience and non-sentience, then causality itself is a strange, ultimately non-local, aesthetic phenomenon. A phenomenon, moreover, that emanates from objects themselves, wavering in front of them like the astonishingly beautiful real illusion conjured in this quotation of Lingus. Lingus's sentence does what it says, casting a compelling, mysterious spell, the spell of causality, like a demonic force field, a real illusion. If we knew it was an illusion, if it were just an illusion, it would cease to waver. It would not be an illusion at all. We would be in the real of non-contradiction. Since it is like an illusion, we can never be sure. What constitutes pretense, says Jacques Lacan, is that, in the end, you don't know whether it's pretense or not. A zone is not